Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and mind, for your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. I do not sit with the worthless, nor do I consort with the hypocrites. I hate the company of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar. O Lord, sing aloud a song of thanksgiving and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. Let us stand as we sing our opening hymn, hymn number 83, O Worship the King. Bless us with the presence of your word and your spirit. Transform us, we pray. Sanctify us by your word, we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Today is a very special day because today Jordan has made a decision to give his life to Jesus Christ. Jordan's been attending church here since uh, 2011, been studying with the Alanis family. Today he makes his commitment to follow Jesus and be baptized. So Jordan, because of your faith in Jesus Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. church family. We want to vote you into membership. We have a motion. 
So moved and seconded. Second. All those in favor say a hearty amen. 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 God bless you. Welcome to the
thank you guys. That was a real blessing. Well, good morning. Good morning. Okay, that was okay. Uh, you know, I wanted to make just a couple of really special announcements, uh, invitations really this morning. We've been talking about this for some time, but this week, this coming week, is the start of two really important ministries here at Vallejo Drive. I want to avoid calling them programs because they're not just programs, they're, they're ministries, they're really opportunities. So the first is this Wednesday, this Wednesday, September 6th at 6.45, will be our very first meeting of a ministry that we're calling Koinonia. Now, Koinonia, if you know, means sharing, togetherness, fellowship, communion, participation, all of those things. A very important word that, that we'll be unpacking uh, a little bit later. But the goal of this ministry is to create a space for us to get to know each other, to pray for each other, to take care of each other, to have that kind of fellowship and communion that we're called to have. But I also want to make it very clear that through this process, we're going to be challenged to grow. Each week at Koinonia, I'll be providing a short reflection that's going to take us through a step-by-step -step process of spiritual development, spiritual uh, maturity. And so then in our breakout groups, we'll have the opportunity to discuss and apply these things in our lives. But I just want to make that very clear that this is a time for community, a time for togetherness. But I don't want you to think, oh, I don't need to go to that. It's just kind of a social thing. This really is going to be a step-by-step -step process. So what that means for you is it's going to be important for you to be there for the very first one because we're beginning a process, right? So I hope to see all of you there this Wednesday at 645. And... That's not all. This Friday at 7.30, our contemporary service, which we've called Praxis Church, is moving to Friday nights. And why is it moving to Friday nights? Does anyone know? Because we want you to be there. We know that we don't want people to have to choose between this service and the contemporary service. So we're moving to Friday night for you. That means you should feel obligated to be there because we're doing this for you, okay? So... Honestly, you know, it's, we're calling it our contemporary service. I really want you to come and check it out because some of you may think, oh, that's not for me, that's not my style. I think you'll be surprised uh, by what this looks like. So please come out, at least for our first week, check it out, Friday night at 7.30. Uh, both of these programs are in the chapel. So an exciting week, the start of many new exciting things here at Vallejo Drive, and I wanted to extend that invitation to you. Uh, at this time, I want to call up uh, Luke. Luke is going to have uh, a baby dedication for us this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like you to welcome with a round of applause um, Roberto, Patty, and Samantha. So this is the Gomez family. I'm sure you know them very well, but let's just welcome them warmly this morning. Well, this is not exactly a baby dedication. It's a child dedication, because Samantha's a bit older than a baby, right? But I just wanted to say, like, it's so wonderful, um, you know, when parents decide that, because there's so many different things you could want for Samantha, right? You could want her to be uh, have worldly riches. You could want her to have worldly success. You could want her to have worldly power. But instead, you guys are today making it a priority um, that she would be uh, raised in the Christian faith and that you want God's will to be the thing that directs her life. And I think that's really special and important. You know, there's a, there's a Bible story that um, speaks to me this morning, which I'd like to share with you. It's in First Samuel. You remember the story when Hannah promises that if she gets pregnant, she's going to lend her child to the Lord. So in First Samuel, Hannah says, Oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. And she says, for this child I prayed, talking about Samuel, and the Lord has granted me the petition that I made to him. Therefore, Hannah says, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is given 
to the Lord. And I think that's an important story because today, in a similar way, you guys have recognized that Samantha is a gift from God, right? And so you're declaring today uh, to God and publicly to the church uh, that you want nothing more than Samantha's entire life to be a sacrifice to God. And so what I'm going to ask you to do now, guys, this is a bit different, but I want you to make a kind of uh, public statement of your commitment. Uh, so if, if you would, I'm going to ask you three simple questions. And if you agree and you subscribe uh, to answer those affirmatively, could you just say, we will? So as a family, will you raise Samantha in the Christian faith? Will you do your very best to teach her how to be a disciple of Jesus? We will. And will you support her in discovering God's will for her life? We will. Amen. So glad you guys said we will to those three questions. And now I'm going to ask you guys, as an extension of the Gomez family, as the church support, I'm going to ask you guys to stand now. If you would, please stand. And I'm going to ask this church, three similar questions to show your support for the Gomez family and your, and your support for Samantha. So again, if you agree with these uh, questions, could you just respond by saying, we will. Will you support Roberto and Patty in raising Samantha? Will you continually pray for them as a family? Will you be there for Samantha and encourage her to live like Jesus? Yeah. Thank you so much. You guys can take a seat. So I hope you guys can feel the love and support that this church offers you and that we promise to be there for you. Um, let's, before we give you a certificate and a small gesture, um, a, a small gift for you, let's just have a word of prayer. Father, gracious Heavenly Father, today we pray especially for Roberto, for Patty, for Carlina, and especially for Samantha. Lord, would you keep their family healthy, keep them happy, keep them unified, and keep them focused on your son, Jesus Christ. So today, we ask a special blessing over their daughter and over your daughter, who has been lent to you, Samantha. We dedicate her to you, and we ask that you would pour out your grace into her life so that she knows you deeply, stays close to you always, and seeks your will for as long as she lives. Amen. Guys, congratulations. I have a small gift for you, a certificate as well. Yeah, congratulations. God bless you. And let's give this wonderful family a round of applause. God bless. I invite the deacons to come forward. Every Sabbath, as part of our worship, we give tithes and offerings. Today, we have the privilege to dedicate our offerings to our home church, our church budget. We can become excited about giving when we think of good things. Now, when we're calling good things, we often feel blessed. And when we feel blessed, we often are more generous. This morning, let's remember these good things. If you are like me, remembering often needs a little help. For example, I remember well that our beloved daughter was born in 1983. It just so happens that 200 years earlier, in 1783, the Paris Peace Treaty was signed by Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, John Jay, David Hartley. This was the official beginning of our great experiment with democracy, the United States of America. Now, from this nation, declaring freedom of worship, separation of church and state, our church was born formally established in the midst of the Civil War in 1863. Today, a little more than a century and a half later, 
there are about 20 million Seventh-day Adventist church members worldwide. Almost nine out of every 10 lives outside the United States, where our church actually began in this country. So in order to grow our Christian ministry nearer home, we always need to give regularly to our local church. Jeremiah 29 tells us that our Lord has plans to give hope and future to each of us. In gratitude, let us give generously to God's plan right here at home. Will the deacons please gather the offering? Thank you so much for all the plans you make for us. Please bless these tithes and offerings that they may multiply like the loaves and fishes and always do good things. Amen. Please remain standing. We want you to... Um, Welcome each other, find someone to share love while the children come forward. My wife is reminding me. The children can come forward now for the children's story while we greet each other. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think I have a wife that reminds me. 
All right, good morning, boys and girls. We have a lot of boys and girls here this morning. I'm wondering if I could get maybe five volunteers. Would you come up and you come up and you'd be right here. Would you stand right here? And I need, yes, you too. Yeah, sure, come along. And we need one more. We have one more volunteer. It's very brave to volunteer. Come on up. When you have no idea what we're going to do, I need you to stand in a line, okay? Can you all stand in a line and turn this way? Face me, okay? Okay, we're going to play a game this morning. We're going to play follow the leader. Do you know follow the leader? You know what, how to do that? You have to do whatever the leader does. I'm going to be your leader, okay? Are we ready? Get ready. We're going to march. We're going to start with our left leg. You ready? And left. Left, right, left. How are we doing? Okay, they're pretty good followers. Okay, now we're going to turn around. We're come back this way. Come on down. Come on down. Oh, you're doing good. Okay, and now we're going to stop. Okay, now turn and face the congregation. Do you know how to do the Disney princess and prince wave? My daughter has a friend who's a princess at Disneyland. No, we have to hold our arm up wide, and we're going to wave to the people all the way in the back of the balcony. Just wave. No, no, like this. See, wave like you're washing the window. And then you wave to the people down front with a little, hello, hello, hello. Oh, very good. And now we're going to come this way, marching. How are we doing? Can we hop? Okay, never mind. I'm too old to hop. Here we go. And now we're going to come and look at the cello. Everybody look at the cello. Say, oh, what a beautiful instrument. No, you have to follow what I do. Point and say, what a beautiful instrument. Okay, pretty good following. Sit down. Okay. Do you know? Good job. They did a good job. Didn't they do a good job? Yeah, good job. Okay. You know, the Bible tells us that we're supposed to follow Jesus. Do you think that's what it means to follow Jesus? To march around the sanctuary and wave to everybody? Is that following Jesus? Can we do that? No. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? You know, I looked up in the dictionary what it means to follow, and there's a couple different things that following means. It means to come after something like Friday comes after Thursday, or to follow in someone's footsteps and do what they did, like you did. It also means to choose someone to be your leader and to be like them. So tell me, what can we do to be like Jesus, to follow Jesus? What can we do? We can help him and serve him. We can help. Yes, that's a good thing we can do, because Jesus was a helper. What else did Jesus do, or does Jesus do, that we can do? Can you think of something else we can do to be like Jesus, to follow him? We can follow him. How do we do that? By praying and worshiping God. By praying and worshiping. Worshiping's good. What else do we know about Jesus? Was he kind? Is Jesus kind? Can we be kind? Would that be following Jesus if we were kind? Sometimes that can be tough to be kind to your little brothers. Um, I don't know. I don't have any little brothers. Is it, is it easy to be kind all the time? No, that's an honest answer. But we can do that. What else can we do to be like Jesus, to follow Jesus? 
Can we be helpful? Maybe we could be responsible. Okay. One more, yeah. We can pick up our toys when we finish playing with them. We can pick up our toys. Moms like that one, huh? That's a good answer. What else can we do to be like Jesus? You can help others. You can help others. That's right. I want each of you to think of one thing that you can do this week to be like Jesus, to follow him, okay? Can you all do that? Can you think of one thing you can practice this week so you can be more like Jesus? Okay, guess what? Children's Church is back. So right now, you are all dismissed to walk reverently through the sanctuary and go to Children's Church. Thank you, boys and girls. This is my father's world.
It's going to be hard to speak after touching heaven. Thank you so much. That was amazing. That medley that uh, Adino Biaggi was playing is uh, one of my favorite pieces of all time, Nella Fantasia. It is time for us to address God in prayer. And um, I have been to churches where people actually came forth and asked the congregation to keep their troubles and their, their problems and to have everyone in the congregation pray for those people. And um, I would like to see that more here as we do a church family type of service where we're more involved with each other's joys and with each other's problems. I would like to ask those people that do have special concerns to come forward. And if anyone has a strong enough concern that they would like to share, I would like to invite you to come forward and share it with us. So while we sing our prayer song, 671, if those that want to come forward do so now. to come up. Thank you, Mrs. Rains. And this is to my church family. I have already written a nice little note and I gave it to Elder Felix to give to Pastor Mark because Elder Henry last week prayed for my friend, Brother Rick Shorter and his family, his wife Gwen. They are, well, actually, the note said sad news today. It is a good Sabbath morning. But the sad news is that Brother Rick Shorter, the National Medical Missionary with CFC Church here in Southern California, and his wife went, he passed away today. I would like you to continue to pray for the family. Amen. And there is a website on Facebook. Thank you very much. Dear Lord, our God, you are Abba our Father. We long to dwell in the secret place of the Most High that we may seek the cool refuge of you, our Almighty God. 
This week there is so much to be grieved over. We are bewildered and humbled by the ravages of floods in and around the city of Houston. The devastation of homes, the finality of the loss of life. Our hearts long for that world where there will be no more loss, no more sorrow or crying. But Lord, how do we beseech you for things we can hardly understand? How do we pray for all this? And now there is more devastation with the fires that have expanded in our neighboring Sunland and Tahanga. Where do we go, Lord, with our petitions? To whom can we turn if, if not to you? You are God of infinite love. You, the God of the impossible. My prayer this morning, Lord, is for a discovery in each heart here today. That no matter what we are facing in life, we can come to you, for you have promised that you are here for us. For if you are not the place where wounded lives can come, where is such a place? I call on the psalm that says, You are kind and forgiving, O Lord, abounding in love to those who call your name. We call on you now, Lord, to bring calm to the storms, to put out the fires, to heal the broken spirits, to restore our devastated lives. We have to thank you, Lord, for the good that we see in humanity. As, the, as we watch the news this week, it's humbling and encouraging to see the thousands of neighbors and good people who come, came from out of state without seeking reward, came to help those in need with clothing, food, words of kindness, understanding, and to help them get to shelter. Examine our church, Lord. Look at all the gifts, abilities, and talents among us. Talents of music, time, the spoken word, talents of comprehension, organization, understanding. The talent of will willingness and appreciation and yes, we often do not see it this way, but the talent of means and all of these, these imperfect gifts are needed to accomplish your perfect purposes and through us. We thank you, Lord, for people like Mark and Luke and Shane, for Wayne and Audrey, Debbie and Alma, for Fred and Irving and Winnie and Vinnie and David and Sam and Gracie, Orphe and Ray and Deanna and John and Liz, for Tim and Sherry, Leanne and Ron, for these talented brothers, Joseph and James, and the families they represent. And there are so many others in this large church family, Lord. There is Lyra and Jelly and Renee and Rolf and Joan, Eduardo, Isabella, Norberto, Ben, and Susie, Janet, Sarah, George. You know them each by name. And you know their hearts. There is Carol and Roger and Wendell. Victor and Doug and Andor, 
We pray for Mike and his family, and Dwina and Vili, Teresa, and more. These people all shine for you, Lord. And there are so many others. I was looking at the list of offices in this church. So many times there are people unsung and unknown, except for to you, the all-seeing God. I put before you, Lord, my dearest friend Karen, who has battled through so many surgeries, so many complications, and done it bravely, and is facing yet another battle with ten days in hospital. And I ask that you would gather into your loving arms, for you are our only hope. Lord, we need to cherish each other, to cherish our differences. For how else are we to learn wisdom if we only want to listen to our own opinions? Our job here on earth is to unite our church in compassion and in the love you have modeled for us. So I ask that you would take away the spirit of fears and destructive fault-finding and give us the ability to put things behind us, to look for a new day with a morning freshness that marks a new beginning, that gift from you to us each day. And let this peace begin with me, with each of us. In the end, Lord, we pray that you will create in each of us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. This is our prayer in the precious name of our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture this reading coming from Matthew 16, 21 to 28, New Revised Standard Version. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is come with his angels in glory, in the glory of the Father, and then he will repay everyone for what he, for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. 
May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the application of his holy word. Thank you. Uh, and thank you again to our musicians. That was uh, wonderful. I know you all felt exactly the same way, so uh, thank you for that. And, you know, today was a really special day. We had a couple of uh, significant moments today. Uh, Jordan's baptism and Samantha's dedication. We're very happy and excited about that. And, you know, as I was reflecting on this scripture uh, this week, uh, in light of these events, in light of these milestones, because what we've seen today in both cases is in some sense the beginning of a Christian life, right? Each in their own way, each in their own level. And so today I think that this scripture challenges us to ask the question of now what? Now what? Because just prior to what Wayne read this morning, Matthew has just recounted Peter's famous confession of faith in Jesus. Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter, of course, responds, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So with this confession of faith, Peter has entered into the first most basic phase of the Christian experience. Peter is officially a Christian. He believes that Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ. That makes him a Christian, right? In the most basic sense. So it's no surprise then to pay attention to what Matthew says next. Because after this confession of faith, Peter says, you are the Christ. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and to undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. You see, Jesus is now showing them exactly what it means to be a Christ, to be the Messiah, to be Christ. You say, okay, you believe that I'm the Messiah? Well, then here's what that really looks like. It involves suffering and death. But Peter, as we just saw, is not okay with this, right? So he pulls Jesus aside privately to rebuke him. He says, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. And I know I've made this point many times before, but how often are we in our own lives like Peter in this situation? How often do we reject the idea that suffering is a part of God's plan for us. I see it in my conversations with people all the time, and I addressed it just a few weeks ago. It felt like last week, but that's because I've been gone. But you remember you know, three or four weeks ago, we were talking about spiritual maturity and Paul with his suffering, but he recognizes God gave this to me that I might find strength in my weakness. But we still have this tendency to be spiritually immature, to be spiritually unprepared for loss or difficulty. So what's Jesus' response to Peter? It's very surprising, very interesting. After Peter says, no, 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 this could never happen to you, Jesus responds by saying, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Now, why is this so surprising? Because Peter here is being the optimist. Peter is the one that, from an outside perspective, looks like the one who really has faith in this situation. Because it's Peter who says, God forbid, you must never suffer, you must never fall on difficult times. Peter must have been thinking to himself, Jesus, you're righteous. And we know that God blesses the righteous. God will always take care of you. Everything will be okay because God will take care of you. You see how what Peter is expressing is a kind of faith. So how surprising is it then 
that Jesus responds to him by saying, Peter, you're thinking about human things, not divine things. You're looking at things from a human perspective, not a divine perspective. Why? Why? Because Peter is thinking short term. Peter is measuring success according to his own human standard. So for you in your life today, maybe you have recently lost your job. Maybe a loved one is experiencing serious illness or a relationship is falling apart. And our instinct, perhaps what we think is our best instinct, our instinct of faith is to turn to God and say, God, fix it. God, fix my problems. God, make these problems go away. And we think that by doing this, that we're exercising faith, but perhaps we're setting our mind on human things. Perhaps we are limiting God, and we want God to work within our plan rather than submitting ourselves to God's plan. Of course, when we go through painful experiences, we pour out our hearts to God. And we tell God what we want. And even Jesus himself does this, so don't mistake my meaning. I'm not saying don't take to God your wants and your needs and your desires. But the lesson that we see from Jesus is that even when he expresses his own desires, our prayer must always be his prayer, which is not my will, but yours be done. Having opened up our hearts to God, our prayer must be this. God, what would you have me do? God, what would you have me learn? God, how can I, through this situation, become more like you? God, how can, through this situation, you be most glorified? Now, it may be, it may be that God will be glorified by you getting a better job than you had before. And we hear those stories, and people come up in front of the church and they give their testimony about how they went through what they thought was a difficult time, but it turned out, in fact, to just be an opportunity for something better. Or God may be glorified in providing a miraculous healing for your loved one. But we must also be aware that God's glory may come through the witness of your patience. Your faithfulness through hardship, your sense of peace through pain, may be God's greatest purpose. We have to be open to that. Now, it's interesting that Jesus says, to Peter, get behind me. Get behind me, because I think there's a kind of double meaning here. On the one hand, it means get out of my way, right? And of course this makes sense because he refers to him as a stumbling block, something that obstructs your path. So Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, don't get in the way of what God is doing. But for Jesus to say, get behind me, carries with it a double meaning because it also foreshadows that Peter, along with the rest of the disciples, must follow in Jesus' footsteps. Get behind me and follow me. This path towards the cross is not just for Jesus. This is the destiny of anyone and everyone who wants to be a disciple of Christ. Anyone who wants to say that Jesus is the Son of the living God, that Jesus is the Christ, he's now unpacking for us what that means, and it means to follow the way of the cross. Now, I want to pause here very deliberately and say that if you've been zoning out up to this point for whatever reason, it's been a long day, I'm asking for your attention because what Jesus had just said here is the clearest, most basic 
and most essential idea in the whole Bible, yet somehow it has become the one that is most misunderstood. Now, as Adventists, uh, we have this tendency to uh, pride ourselves on going against the mainstream. You know what I'm talking about, right? That everybody else got this thing wrong, but we read the Bible for its plain word. We see what it really says, right? You know exactly what I'm talking about, okay? But what we're talking about right here is, in my opinion, the most prevalent of deceptions, the most problematic, the most, perhaps even the most harmful error in the history of Christianity. I've heard it in every denomination. We've sung it in so many songs. We've studied it in the Sabbath school quarterly. We've shared it with our neighbors. We've been told since the time that we were children that this is the good news of the gospel. But for that very reason, I can't help but think that this is one of the devil's most successful deceptions. Do you want to know what I'm talking about? <laughs> the lie is this, that Jesus suffered and died on the cross so that you don't have to. Nowhere, nowhere does the Bible teach this. And as we just read, Jesus makes it perfectly clear that to be a disciple of Jesus means to take up our own cross and be crucified with him. And this is the consistent message from Jesus, from Peter and James and John and Paul. Christianity is an invitation to suffering. And when we see Jesus on the cross, as you've heard me say before, when we see Jesus on the cross, we don't see what could have been us. Oh, thank God that he took my place and suffered so that I don't have to. No, when we look at Jesus on the cross, we don't see what could have been us. We see an example that we are called to imitate. We are seeing what we ought to be. Now, Peter himself learned this lesson. You see, because in this conversation, Peter doesn't get it. Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. Peter says, no, 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 that can't be. But as we know later in life, Peter comes to understand this truth. And I can't help but think that when Peter writes his first letter, that we now have in our Bibles as First Peter, I can't help but think that this interaction with Jesus was in his mind as he told the church these words. First Peter chapter 2, Peter says, It is a credit for you if being aware of God, in other words, having your mind on divine things, just like Jesus said, right? It's a credit for you if being aware of God, you endure pain, while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called. Now pay attention. Peter says to the church, to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you leaving you, what, an example so that you should follow in his steps. You see, the suffering of Christ is for us an example that we should follow in his steps. He goes on to say, he committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. You see, Jesus does not say that some of his disciples must take up their cross. He does not say that taking up the cross is a possibility that you have to be aware of. Jesus says it is a necessity. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Now, fortunately for us, Jesus unpacks a little bit further what this means and what this looks like. He says, 
for those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their soul? Or what will they give in return for their soul? In other words, to find true life, to find eternal life, we have to learn to let go of the lives that we have. To take up your cross means to live every day with this attitude of self-sacrifice, to live not for yourself, but for the glory of God. And isn't this exactly what Paul means when he tells the Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. Therefore what? Therefore I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Paul is one who has let go of his own self-interest. He's not driven by a desire for success. He's not driven by a desire for happiness in the ordinary sense. He lived each day not for himself, but for the glory of God, because he had the big picture in mind. He understood that any happiness, any success in this life is nothing compared to a life with God. So what does he do? He says he pours out his life like a drink offering. You, ju you can just picture that image of someone just taking a full cup of wine and just pouring it out as an offering. He says, that's what I do with my life. I pour my life out. He lives his life with a radical and reckless love. Paul here is someone who lost his life for the sake of Christ, but in so doing, he found it. And this is exactly what he describes to the Philippians. He says, whatever gains I had, I've come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as a loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, but I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Now, is that true of you? You want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Well, what does he say? And the sharing of his sufferings. By becoming like him in his death, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You see, Paul is so consumed, so overwhelmed with his love for Christ, that everything he has accumulated, every possession, every achievement is considered worthless compared with knowing Christ. And so the thing in life, and this is, this is just the most surprising part of the New Testament, and, and it, it explains why we've lost sight of this message, because it is difficult to understand. It's difficult to swallow. But Paul here expresses that the one thing in his life that he cherishes the most is his own suffering. Why? Because he knows that it is through that suffering that he's being drawn closer to Christ. And that it is through that suffering that he is being made more like him. So if we take up our cross and follow him, we will also be raised with him. As Paul writes to Timothy, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. And so Jesus finishes his conversation with Peter by holding out this same hope. He says, the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. And we know that Christ will come to reward those who are faithful to him. Those whom Christ has honored with the crown of martyrdom will be crowned on the last day with eternal life. Now, God may or may not call you to take up a literal cross. 
to go and be executed for his sake. But we cannot dismiss that possibility. Right now, even today, all around the world, there are people who lose their lives for being followers of Jesus. But even if that is not your fate, that's not for you to decide. Your responsibility here and now today, and every morning that you wake up, is to think of the cross. And when you see the cross in your mind, when you're reminded of what Christ has done for you, you pledge yourself as an offering. You pour out your own life, letting go of the achievements and the possessions and the desires of your own heart. You let go of those things and as Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual worship. Let's pray. Father God, we are in awe of the sacrifice of your Son and the love that you have shown to us through his mercy, through his compassion. But we pray today that as we join ourselves to him, as we become members of the body of Christ, that we too would be sanctified by your Holy Spirit, that our lives, our bodies, may be acceptable to you as a sacrifice. God, there are difficult things in our life that we have a hard time letting go of, things that we're afraid of, but we need your Spirit to carry us through so that if we can let go of our lives, we can find ourselves in you. We thank you for your love. We pray for your continued guidance and blessing. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Well, I invite you to stand with me as we sing our closing hymn, a hymn that I think begins to grasp this idea of clinging to the cross, clinging to the cross, the old rugged cross. Stand with me, hymn number 159, the old rugged cross.
present your bodies as living sacrifices. He gives these instructions, and I just want to leave you with these words. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, but be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering and persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. 